We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. Just before we get into today's episode, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to our weekly devotional group. Just text the two words, Promise Keepers, to 31996. Every week you'll receive a challenging devotional that will inspire you to put your faith into action in the real world. Again, text Promise Keepers to 31996. And now, here's today's show. So we're talking to Steve Farrar, who's written the book on being a man and being a Christian man. And we're going to talk about what's wrong with the church, what's wrong with men, and what do we do to fix it. So uh, let's go, man. Steve Farrar. Ken. Good to see you. Yeah, man. Um, so you're on the pastor's board of Promise Keepers, and the pastor's board is the board that keeps me from doing things that are stupid. You haven't been totally successful, by the way. <laughs> well, hey, listen. Listen, I I have enough hours in stupid. I could uh, I could have earned a PhD if I really worked at it. Yeah, yeah you have a We've PhD. All been there. Maybe you should get one. And maybe you could teach the course. I, I could probably teach a PhD class in stupidity myself, <laughs> yes. Personal experience. So it's you, Stu Weber, Randy Alcorn, Crawford Loritz, Gene yeah. Getz, and Tommy Barnett. Yeah. And you guys just guard the theology of Promise Keepers. Uh, watch out for the speakers that we get. And, and in general, just help me to be a lot wiser than I am on my own. That's scripture, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, we're all, you know, we're there are two things you can't do by yourself. You can't get married by yourself. I mean, at least not yet. I'm sure a federal judge will change that yes. here before long. Yeah. But the second thing you can't do by yourself is live the Christian life by yourself. I mean, you just can't. And that's true for all of us. And um, so anyway, we're just looking out for each other, you know, and walking through life together. And there's um, Jesus sent them out two by two it's not a, 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 you know, a Lone Ranger thing, as we've said many times. So, yeah, we're looking out for each other. I yeah. mean, you know a little bit about that. I mean, you wrote Point Man. Yeah. And Point Man, well, you just had the 20-year anniversary, right? 30, actually. 30. 30 oh years. Gosh. Yeah, crazy. I yeah. read that book like... You were four years old. <laughs> <laughs> Only in maturity level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you, and, and you've dealt with this. I mean, we, we said we we're going to talk about what's wrong with men. And I think you just nailed one of the biggest things that we, we keep trying to do life alone and we can't. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, one man sharpens another. Yeah. 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 You, you know, it, it seems to me that the enemy has certain strategies that he uses over and over again. And when you see someone who, um, who seems to be walking with the Lord and serious about the Lord and pursuing after. And then we've all seen this and it breaks our heart. They'll, they'll, it comes out that they've been living a double life. There's a great fall, there's adultery, whatever it is. What happens is that the enemy separates a guy out. He isolates a guy mm. and the guy might be in relationships, but he starts pulling back. He starts pulling away. Uh, I've got a guy in my mind right now that, I mean, I have known for um, almost 50 years. And about 35 years ago, we were working together in some ministry things. Several of us noticed he was just subtly pulling away. And there was something going on. And he he didn't he didn't want anyone to know, and, and that's human nature. So yeah, I mean that's one of the enemy's strategy. And he who walks with wise men will be wise. So the enemy is always trying to pull us away and uh, not walk with God's men. That's that's the strategy. Always has been. Always will be. Well, you know, it's an interesting visual. Because, you know, First uh, Peter says the enemy walks around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour it. And yeah. what do lions do? They go up to the herd. Or they're, they're looking for trying to cut somebody off from the herd. They start yeah. chasing the herd and see, well, who gets away from it? Exactly. And they, yeah. then the lions go after that. Yeah. 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 That's exactly what you're saying Satan's doing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's how he works. So 
I, I think we have to not only guard our hearts, Proverbs 4, but we have to guard our relationships and, and make sure there's someone in our lives that can ask us anything. But then you got to tell them the truth. Mm. When we when we start living a double life, and this is what happens, you know, guys sometimes get real excited. We're we're going to start up an accountability group, and <laughs> right. which is great. The, the, the accountability groups work when I think you have a history with the guys you're meeting with. You you, you you've got a little bit of history. You just didn't meet last week. Um, mm. how, uh, you don't you don't know them, so you need to have a history, and um, you you have to make a commitment in your heart that you're going to tell the truth. You cannot lie, and and guys lie in accountability groups because they don't want anybody to know. So you have to want to be accountable. You have to welcome accountability. You have to seek it. And you can't lie. Well, every policeman listening to this right now is going, every time a person opens their mouth, they're lying, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we get programmed. Yeah. yeah. Why Why isn't a wife good enough for that? I mean, I know there's there's a lot of women who want to be that intimate partner with their husband. Oh, well, he can tell me everything. I can tell him everything. And we're all we need. And I think it's actually part of the danger. We've got to get women to understand men need men. Um, there's yeah. just a, a, something yeah. there that a woman can't be that that sharpening object that a, her husband needs. Yeah, she can, she can to a degree, and if he who finds a, a good wife finds a good thing. And, you, you know, I, I'm fortunate. Mary is, is a great partner for me and has been for 43 years, and I, I'm, I'm so thankful for her. But there is, as you're saying, there's a different dynamic between two guys. Because uh, it, it's David and Jonathan, uh, it is a there's a connection that can, that men can have that is that is steadfast. It is pure. It's holy. It's uh, it, 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 it's hard to put words on it, but it uh, I, I think I, I think there's something to what you're saying. There is an aspect. To a, to a godly masculine relationship that sharpens like no other. I think that's true. Well, I think there's instincts in men and instincts in women that are different. That's why the Bible says older men teach the younger men, older women teach the younger women. But, you know, women don't understand that, you know, the need a guy has if someone pops off to his wife to punch the other guy in the mouth. And the, yeah. the wife's like, what is your problem? And yeah. because there's something in us, a yeah. drive that says, no. I got to protect my family, the right. reputation of my wife and my kids right. that other men understand those different drives, just like women have their own ways sure. of thinking that other women yeah. understand. Yeah. Well, God made male and female different. Our culture wants to say they're the same. They're not the same. Um, when, when the culture says men and women are equal, well, the Bible says men and women are equal in the sense that we're male and female are made in the image of God and we have access to God, equal access. But that doesn't mean we're the same. Um, the culture is all about women. The culture is all about masculinizing women and feminizing men. Um, God wants men to be masculine. Uh, that's who He made them to be: to be, to be protectors, to be providers, to be um, protectors of their family. I mean, uh, it, it's. Your your family you're 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 the family pastor. That's your little church. So a lot of times, yeah, wives don't get that. It's because God made us differently, and we complement each other. But there's a time when a guy's got to stand up and protect and provide and go to the mat, and you just do what you have to do. And it's a love like Jesus has: love your husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Uh, this is interesting, Ken. Over the over the years, I've had. I'm maybe three women spread out over 30 years come up to me and say, I'm a single mom. I've got a son. Um, the, the, the My husband has taken off and I'm concerned about my son. Well, sure, of course you are. 
And, uh, and she said, one of the things I'm concerned about is he wants to play football. And I said, okay. And, she, and I said, you don't want him to play football, do you? And she said, well, no. Well, why is that? Well, I don't want him to get hurt. And I said, sure. She said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, let me tell you why I let my boys play football. And my, my dad and my two brothers, my dad had me and my two brothers play football. My dad played football. We play football in our family. Um, hey, your brother played at USC. That's a, that's football. Yeah, and your other uh, brother played at UCLA. Yeah, what, I was mean, your, what was your problem? Well, I, I wasn't any good. <laughs> that was my problem. Uh, but you know, it's 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 interesting. The, the, I kind of lose them there. I, I, I'll say I think you ought to let your son play football. Well, why would I let him put, play football? Because he might get hurt. I said no, he will get hurt. Hmm. That's one of the purposes of football. You will get hurt. But think about this. You want your husband, you want your son to grow up and be a godly man. He said, yeah, absolutely. His job is going to be to get hurt for his wife. And if you put a fear in a little boy of getting hurt, it's going to be real hard for him to be a spiritual leader because he is supposed to get hurt for his family. Jesus got hurt for the church. Jesus sacrificed himself for the church. That's what a husband does. That's what a Christian man does. So you want to teach boys not to be crazy, and, but you don't want to feminize them to the point, well, he might get hurt. He needs to get hurt and then get up and keep moving. Anyway, I kind of went down a rabbit well, trail there. Well, this is why it's important to have a father and a mother in a home, right? Exactly. It's, it's the mother's job to pick um, the child up and say it's going to be okay and, yeah. and kiss the wound. And it's, yeah. the, it's the dad's job to go stop your whining and get going, get back yeah. in the game. Right? Yeah. And they're both necessary. Yeah, and it's not like a dad isn't is is always the hard guy. Uh, he's a model of that, but there's also a tenderness. Mm -hmm. Our good buddy Stu Weber wrote Tender Warrior, and if anyone's a, a warrior, it's Stu. Yeah, right. And if anyone has a tender heart, it's Stu. Yeah. I I, I would always say Stu knows 14 different ways to kill you, but <laughs> at, at a men's conference, we did a lot of them together. But I'd also say this is when I'd introduce him. The thing about Stu is, yeah, he knows 14 different ways to kill you, and he could do it. But here's the thing. You put Stu in a, in a room with a bunch of guys, and in about five minutes, he's going to figure out the guy in the room with the broken heart. That's right. Because he's got a tender heart. See, there's the balance there. And, yeah, our wives come along, and th th that's why God wants a mom and a dad in there. But, uh, yeah, there's a – so anyway, yeah. This is fun stuff to talk about, isn't it? Well, we're not it's because it's not talked about enough, and it's obvious. Yeah, and people listen to this going, "Well, that yeah, isn't it obvious?" You, you think about men and women being different. Um, just to think of the idea of sex for a minute, a man can have sex with zero consequences in in the in the nature. I mean, the government may, you know, if he give him consequences, yeah. but yeah, there are zero consequences to man. And for a woman, every sexual encounter is a possible life altering event called pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Now you think about the massive difference in that perspective yeah. to think, to think that men and women are the same is absurd or to think that it's yeah. a social construct. Yeah. And the other side of that too is regardless of the size of a man, how much stronger they are than women. And I saw this in the police academy in, in Los Angeles in, in 1989. I went through the LA police academy. We had 68 people in my class. We had 60 men and eight women. And what they would do is they would match us up to fight uh, by size. And uh, women were new, relatively new to the LAPD at that time. So mm -hmm. it was, they were still trying to figure out how to deal with this. And they had just brought in fist fighting with boxing gloves on. So you'd run around the track kind of signaling a, a foot pursuit and then you run into a ring and you beat each other's reins in you know for a certain <laughs> amount so, so you'd understand what it's like to be on the street right sure yeah well they they first said well women can't fight the men and then some of the other ones well well this is absurd how many you know what are we gonna do on the street right so they would put the women against other men that were their size so uh and they would get in a fight and and literally we had one woman quit and she said i had no idea that men were that much stronger than than mm -hmm. women she said i i she mm -hmm. was up against a guy who was five foot three and 120 mm -hmm. pounds. And, and well, she's like, oh, my goodness, I had no idea it was like that. Yeah. So the physical strength difference yes. between a man and a woman, too, would make a massive difference just in how you perceive the world. Yeah. So, so it's just silly yeah. to say it's all a social construct or you can choose what you want to be. Yeah. When you throw pregnancy and you throw physical ability differences in, yeah. you're just going to have a different way of seeing the world. Yeah. 
Well, uh, God created men with 40% more muscle mass than women. And just physiologically, um, my, my son John was elk hunting last year up in Colorado. You know, they, they parked somewhere and hiked in. I'm trying to get miles. you Texans to stay out of Colorado. Yeah, well, you keep coming. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's a free country, <laughs> at, least, at least for now it is. Yeah. Uh, that's probably going to change, but yeah. I'm not going down that path right now. So, John, he's in back there for, I don't know, a week, 10 days. And when he, he came home, we're talking, and he said, and so, you know, they get an elk, and they got to carry that sucker out and, you know, butcher it up and the whole thing. Get it back to the truck, get ice on it. At 20 miles in, 20 miles out. And he said to me, and, you know, he, he was just, he said, you know, Dad, this is how people lived for thousands of years. And he said, what's going on in our culture with men and women and feminism? Uh, it wouldn't cut it in the wilderness because there are certain roles that men have to play and were designed to play. And, and their wives would play other roles because the wives just did not have the strength to do it. And it's just real clear in the wilderness. It's not real clear right now. I thought that was an interesting observation, and, and it's, a, it's a right one. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't get elk hunters. You know, I mean, I love to eat elk, and yeah. I go to a restaurant, I get it with this nice huckleberry sauce on it. Yeah. It's all right there on the plate. Yeah. I don't have to shoot it and clean it. And it's yeah. amazing. I, I don't know if these hunters realize that they serve that stuff in restaurants. Yeah, I'm not sure he's aware of that. that Maybe uh, you should tell him. It's, I'll let him know next yeah. time I see him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm with you. I just go down and <laughs> get a plate. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to work hard at playing. They work hard. That, that's a workout. Yeah. So you, you are one of those guys I look to as uh, just one of those beacons of truth. I mean, um, there are certain guys that just understand the Bible, and you know, I say that you know the attitude is, "What about what the Bible says? Don't you understand?" You know, there are certain people that. Everything they read, you know, in the Bible, there's always some game they play or some way they try to jam it into their own understanding. You're not one of those guys. You're like, this is what it says, and we're going to do what it says. But that didn't come. You know, you, we see guys like you who are elders in the church, um, and we tend to think. Let me back up just a little bit to humanize that a little bit. What I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. My son said to me, you know, one day, Dad, I just want to be like you. I, I just. I want sure. to be a man like you. And I'm like, well, you have to understand, I, I wasn't who I am when I was your age. I, I became who I, yeah. who I am through pain and, and suffering and failure and success. Right. God has molded me into this guy. That there's, a, there's some years that go on you that you become who you are. And yeah. so in the church, I think we do that. We look at, at the great leaders of the church, the great saints, and we, we think, oh, well, I could never be like that, realizing there's a whole lifetime that formed that man or woman into that person, oh, yeah. right? sure. You, you know, as part of becoming who you are now, you went through some serious depression. Yeah, when you were in your early thirties, maybe you've been through seminary. You yeah, know, great guys like Stu Weber. Yeah, um, how, how did that form who you are now? And and tell us about that depression because lots of guys are struggling with that. Yeah, um, I didn't talk about that depression for a long time because I was, I was embarrassed that I went through it. Uh, it was in my early thirties. I was. Um, I, I want to, I'm, I'm just pausing here to try to edit this in my own head because it can, it, it needs to be brief. But I, I, I came out of seminary and I was pretty confident. I, I, I just was confident. Um, my, my mother said of her three sons, and my mom's 92 and lives with us and she's pretty sharp and in good health and she, she mentioned this the other day. Uh, we were talking about uh, the, my brothers, and she, I, I said, Mom, do you remember saying that you wanted to raise confident boys, but this is ridiculous? And she said, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, so, which is good. You want, I, I would say this, uh, love them, you know, discipline them, uh, figure out, help them figure out their gifts, how God's made them, and then encourage them and uh, get them on their way. And well, I don't want the kid to be overconfident. Well, I'd rather have one be overconfident than 
lacking confidence. Because yeah, if you're sure. lacking confidence, you'll struggle for the rest of your life. If you're overconfident, believe me, God has ways of knocking that off. And he can do it pretty quickly. We've talked about that a lot, you and I. Oh, man, I'll, I'll tell you what. So that goes to my depression. So I came out of seminary. I took a little church in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is not the Bible Belt. and uh, <laughs> But I was, uh, I, I had a lot of, I didn't realize it. I had a lot of what the Bible calls selfish ambition. Hmm. I want, and I would never say this, I'd two, never admit three. it. Yeah, I wanted to be uh, successful. I wanted to be well known. I wanted to build a big church. Uh, there's a right kind of ambition, which is to please the Lord. Selfish ambition. Um, James says, if you have selfish ambition, it is earthly, it is natural, it is demonic. Mm. And where there is selfish ambition, there is disorder in every evil thing. Now, I was smart enough to cover it, and I don't think I realized the extent of it. So I was going to grow this church, and I was going to make this church happen. And the Lord just kind of stopped me. Every time we'd make a staff hire and the church started to grow, it, it didn't work out. And this went on for a couple of years, and I felt like a failure. And being confident, I went ahead. I thought, you know what? I've done everything I can do here. I had counsel not to leave the church. I went ahead and resigned because I figured I'd land somewhere else. And the Lord let me sit for a year. Mm. And I interviewed with seven different churches. They all turned me down. And one morning, Mary woke up and heard me downstairs sobbing. She could hear me because I was so broken. I realized I, I had gotten ahead of the Lord. I had my plan, not his plan. I thought I was the shepherd. I, I mean, it was devastating. And I, I'd hurt my family financially. It just, I mean, I hit bottom. And so I cried four to six hours a day, um, probably for the next six, seven, eight months. And I, I mean, that's a lot of crying. Yeah, how do you get through that? I mean, really, well, I, I, I can't a, even imagine. A, 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 a counselor in the church who I used to send people to. Of course, I'd never go see him because, right. you know, I had it together. But I went to see him because I was, um, Josh was in a high chair and I was pouring juice and I spilled the juice and I started crying. And Mary said, you know, you better call him. So I did, and he explained to me, he said, look, you kind of have, you've had so much loss because it, financially you've had loss. All these different things had happened. And it was just the Lord put me in the wilderness. So he, I, I said, listen, I cry all the time. He said, I said, am I going to go into an institution? He said, no, I, I had no reference. Really? You asked, you asked Oh, I, I, I thought I was, they were going to lock me up somewhere. So you're the stud football player. You're a tough guy. You've been to seminary. I don't no. know if you had your PhD yet. No, not yet. But And and you're you're saying, am I'm I going to like go a into baby, an institution? And I'm thinking they're going to put me in an institution. Wow. Because I had never been like this, not even close. And he said, no, here's what's going to happen. This is going to take you. Uh, two and a half to three years to to, to pull out of. Uh, he says, you'll come out of this. You're not going into an institution. The crying will go away. And I remember I asked him, uh, I, I, I can't remember, it was February. I said, do you think it's possible on the 4th of July that I wouldn't cry? I'll never forget that. And he said, I think that's possible. He said, no, if it happens, don't let it throw you because that's going to incrementally go away. And the, he was a real gift to me, just helping me. I, I, I had no... He was like a wilderness guide. So anyway, uh, what happened was, finally, I uh, so I was going to build this great church with this little tiny legalistic Baptist church, keeps calling me. And that's where I wound up going. And the first time they called me, I was real nice to the guy, and I put the phone down, and I said out loud, I would never go there. Well, that's where I went for the next three years. Where was that? Because I knew the church. I had no, where, where, where was it? Where, In where? the San Francisco Bay oh. Area. It was... 10 miles from the church that I had that was growing and doing really well. So I would still see people, people from the first church at the grocery store and they would think, what happened to Farrar? Right. And what's he doing up at that little tiny legalistic Baptist church? Well, I didn't want to be there, but the Lord sent me there. That was my wilderness. And those people were older. Uh, I was 32. Oh, they geez, were all, you know, tough. the average age was 65, 70. I wasn't going to grow that church. And um, I, I, that was depressing to me. I, every time I go up to the office, I was depressed. But the Lord had me there, and he set me down. 
And that's where I really, I, I started digging into the scriptures every morning. I, I studied the Bible, I've been the same, but I mean, I'm digging into the scriptures to survive. And the Lord just started putting me back together. And um, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this except to say, as David said, it was good for me that I was afflicted. I look back on that and that was the most valuable time, the most valuable three years of my entire life. Uh, God used that to, as he always does. If someone's listening to this and you're in the hardest place you've ever been in your life, the Lord is with you there and he has put you there. Even, even if it's your own sin, he's sovereign over that and he is shaping you. He will form you. He is disciplining you. Um, Hebrews 12, if you've never been disciplined by the Lord, you're not a child of God. Every son that he loves, he disciplines. Uh, uh, and to be disciplined is, it's, it's no fun, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So that's how God started to put me on a path. And as I was there, I found out about this doctoral program because a couple of the profs, came to this little church and spoke and said, you ought to be in this program. And that's how I got into it, which eventually I wound up writing my dissertation on men in the church, which eventually I had no idea God was going to put me in men's ministry um, for the rest of my life. So I look back on it and I can see exactly what God, I'm, now it's all clear. Mm -hmm. Then it was, I was totally confused. Does that make any sense? A lot. I mean, you've heard me say a million times, as people who know me, you know, I want to surround myself with men who walk with limps. That's and it. There's something about men that they need to be broken. Yeah. And yeah. when you see men, especially church leaders who haven't been broken, yeah. there's an arrogance. Yeah, there is, is a, yeah. a foolishness. Yeah. And you see guys that have had the crap kicked out of them like yeah. you have, like I have, yeah. uh, like all the guys that are on our team. Yeah. Um, there's a humility of yeah. we all are quite confident that um, absent the Lord, we're nothing. That's it. And you get some of these young guys who think, well, God's really lucky that he's on their team. Hey, you know, we all start out young. <laughs> and would George, uh, who was that guy? Uh, George Bernard Shaw. Youth is such a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a tragedy to waste it on young people. It's so true. But, uh, you know, you got to get hurt. You 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 got to get your leg broke. Uh, you, you've uh, you got to walk with a limp, and it's the best thing that happens. And in that wilderness, I, man, I'll tell you, Mary and I prayed two things. We prayed, and it was for me. I mean, you know, she had been through a depression a couple of years before I met her which not as severe as mine, but it was serious. So she could understand. And I helped her empathize helpful. with you. Man, she encouraged me. She encouraged me. And I'd come home from that office. And it was a, the average age of that church was 70 years old. I mean, the age I am now. Uh, there were a bunch of old people. And I'm in my early 30s. I'm ready to change the world. And there was nothing to do. There was no counseling. If you've got a, if you're, hey, if you've been married 50 years and you've got a lousy marriage, you're not going in for counseling. You're going to buy another TV and put it in the bedroom, you know? So I had nothing to do. And that's when suddenly this... Buy another TV and put it in the bedroom. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, what else are you going to do? So uh, that's when this came along. Hey, there's this doctoral program you could get in. And it's long distance. And, and the guys on the board, I mentioned it to them. And they said, oh, that'd be great. Those classes, could you come and teach us some of that stuff? And I said, well, yeah. Well, they, they paid for it. They were so excited. That was part of my path. Mm. And God set me in a place where I didn't have anything to do. And that was an incredibly rigorous program. So all I did basically was preach. And I'd cry every Sunday morning up there to preach. And then I'd wipe the tears off in the parking lot and get up there and say, hey, how you doing? Praise God. Really? Yeah. And then I'd preach. And, and almost the first two years, I only preached out of Psalms because that's what I was in. I was so broken, I was just in the Psalms. And I could pull it together, and the Lord helped me, and then I'd get in the car, and I'd, as soon as I got in the car and they couldn't see me, I'd start crying on the way home. Wow. Because I was so depressed. But God used that in my life. 
I mean, he used that and I needed it. Uh, it was just part of the process and I thank God for it. But he doesn't leave you there. Every I began to read a book by Martin Lloyd-Jones called Spiritual Depression. And he was a medical doctor before he was a pastor. And I think he was the greatest expository preacher of the 20th century. And that book, Spiritual Depression, it, it healed. There was so much scripture in there. Um, and, and it was so practical. The Lord used that to put me together. And so when I got into men's ministry, one, one time I was up speaking and I suddenly mentioned the depression. And I, you, you know, suddenly you're into a story and you think, oh, how did I get here? Yeah. And I wanted to get out of it as soon as I can. Because, I mean, I didn't want to tell anybody that. Well, I, the rest of that weekend, I had guys lined up. Hey, can I talk to you about depression? Can I talk to you about depression? You know how you're cried like that? That's what I do all the time, man. Mm. And I thought, this is crazy. So I started talking about it. And that's how God equipped me, I think, primarily to minister to men. And what I did is he, he, I dove into the scriptures. And, and the scriptures I memorized. And I would hold on to scriptures for weeks. Um. He's near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. I mean, I'm done. I mean, I'm di I'm done. But this says you save those who are crushed. I'm I'm obliterated. And I was convinced God would never use me. I was utterly convinced of it. Now, what do you do? I mean, you so your entire background is seminary. That's what you you have. You're in your early 30s, and you're convinced yeah. God's not going to use you, and you have no skills or education for anything else. Yeah, that's a pretty tough spot to be in. Yeah, it is. And, and see, yeah, that's the other part. God, God will put you in a wilderness, and this is what he does. You, you can't see any possible way out. That's really an important thing. And everybody's wilderness, every guy's wilderness is different. But what it, there are certain things it has in common, and one of the things it has in common is you don't see any possible way of getting out. Because maybe you've lost your reputation, or you've lost a marriage, or you've lost this, or your money, or you've lost this, and there's no possible way you can recover, is what you're thinking. But Psalm 23, 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and literally the Hebrew says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of deepest darkness, even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness. So when it says death, it's correct because the deepest and darkest valley we'll ever go through is death. But there are other valleys that are very, very deep and very, very dark. And you think, I'll never get through this. I'll never get through it. But thou art with me. <laughs> See, he'll walk you through it. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said, every valley, every wilderness has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You just can't see it. God's not going to leave you there forever. It's for a season. And the key, so going back to what Mary and I would pray, we prayed that I would have a teachable heart. I, I, I would pray, Lord, don't let me miss one thing that you're trying to teach me here. I don't want to flunk this class. I don't want to have to go back to summer school three years later. Yeah. I mean, I want to learn this, Lord. Would you show me what you have for me? So you had that wisdom in... In the middle of this valley, at least you knew. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but I, I, I did. And I asked him for that. Um, I knew he was trying to get my attention. And I, I just did not want to miss it. It hurt too bad. Honestly. <laughs> the pain was so bad, I just... I, here's the deal. I didn't want to prolong it by being unteachable. Mm. You want to you wanna get all in with, with the Lord Jesus. No hidden sin, no secret sin. He wants truth in the innermost being. I, I have a friend that eight months ago wrote me an email as I was reading, as I was going through a car wash. And it started out by saying, Steve, I've been living a double life for 25 years. And it's tragic. He was extremely involved in ministry. Um, and uh, what I'm praying for him is, as David said in Psalm 51, uh, that the Lord desires truth in the innermost being, that he'll just, no games, no more secrets, just strip it bare 
utter truth before the Lord. And the Lord, and then the Lord is compassionate to guys like that. And he loves to take guys. <laughs> you think you're finished. You think you're dead. You think you'll never recover. Ray Steadman used to say, resurrection power always works best in a graveyard. Mm. And then he'll raise you up. He's not, he's not done. And you can't see a way out. That's okay. You don't need to see a way out. He already knows the way out. He's got the next chapter written for you. And that friend of yours who wrote you that email, you had to call me and yeah. you had to call some other people yeah. because there was some um, uh, mm -hmm. staining of you that happened that you had to make sure that you'd clear it up. So sometimes, you know, sin is never personal. And he thought it was all about him and it was all a secret. And when that came out, there were other people who got hurt. Yeah, a lot of other people that he was associated with. And I mean, not to mention his wife and yeah well, adult yeah. kids and but um yeah and others needed to be told and warned that unfortunately this is what's happened and uh, uh y y you know because guys sometimes take shortcuts and they try to jump right back into ministry that can't happen today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of waterstone for nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities like Promise Keepers by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan, utilizing business interests, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. And now, back to today's show. So we're talking to Steve Farrar, the author of Point Man, and um, talking about depression and how that, how that helped to form you. <laughs> yeah. And now I want to move to, yeah. into Point Man yeah. and into why you had such a passion to be in the men's ministry. Because it's a tough, yeah. men are tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a certain niche there. Um, you know, Coach McCartney had told me, you know, lots of stuff about leading a men's ministry and mm -hmm. uh, trying to he keep me from stepping in the pitfalls that, that, yeah. that he did. Yeah. What What was it, I mean, that caused you to become such a powerful force? And, and how did God give you so much wisdom to write Point Man? And, and... Um, that's the providence of God. The church starts growing and people come in for counseling. I mean, what do I know? I'm a 28 right. year old yeah. punk. <laughs> and but they're and they got all these issues and i began to realize people would leave and i began to realize if what i just heard you know back when in math to before you work a fraction reduce a fraction if i take what i just heard and reduce it down to its lowest common denominator about 85 percent of the time the real issue was the man in the home wasn't being the man is that right yeah it's just an observation. So what I did... And we're talking late 70s, long time ago. We're talking... Uh, let me think. We're talking 78. 77, 78. So I, what I did consciously from then on, um, I was probably, I don't know, 29. I, I decided right then and there I was going to preach to the men. And I, never, mm -hmm. I never announced it. I never said it. But I just, right then, from then on out, I just focused on men. And I figured if I had the men, I'd have the, the wives and the kids would show. But the men were strategic. Joel Aldrich said one time that uh, all of God's people are equally precious, but not all of God's people are equally strategic. Men are strategic. Uh, that's why the enemy goes after men. And it's interesting, isn't it? You look at churches, mega churches all over America. They got, the, I mean, if you're left-handed, they got a ministry for you. If, if you know, if you drive a Subaru, they got a ministry for you. If you, they got a ministry for everybody <laughs> except the most strategic guys in the body of Christ, which are men. Now, why are why are men most strategic? I mean, some women, men. Some because women are called. hearing that and they're going, "Well, why would you say that?" What? Because God's called you to 
to be a husband and be a father. And if you're not one yet, you probably will be. And not live with her, marry her. Marry her and commit. Uh, that's what men do who follow Jesus. Uh, you're called you're called to shepherd that family. You're called to pastor them, to, to protect, to provide, to teach. Uh, that's your little flock. That's your little that's your sphere of influence. And uh, you're strategic. And you know, we can all read the statistics. What happens when fathers leave? Well, I think you know part of the reason is, uh, not always, because we live in this broken, twisted world, but the love of a mother is fairly constant. Right? Yeah. There are some women that are monsters, yeah. but That's but right. for the most part, yeah. you can count on mom being there. For for the fathers, it's a variable. Dads leave. Yeah. Dads abuse. Dads get drunk. Dads yeah. are workaholics. Dads don't talk to their kids, yeah. and so yeah. we find that if if the mother a love uh, the love of a mother is more constant. It's that father that's really the variable that forms in you. Yeah. I saw my dad with his Bible open every morning and it had an effect on you for the rest of your life. Yeah. I think maybe that's why men are more strategic because the, the women are, are, are a bit more foundationally constant and we can sort of count on them to a much higher degree, meaning yeah. Yeah. the capture rate for these men who are all over the place is much greater if we can bring them in because the women are already re ready to come in. The women are already more... Um, they're focused relational. on their kids they're, and they're nurturers and they yeah that that's that's in, that's within them uh, unless they get hard hearts so but the but the men you're exactly right and that's why he the lord gets a hold of a man and he needs to be your lord and he's calling the shots that's why he set me down for that depression he needed hey steve look it because this was always my tendency, is to get out ahead. Now, you said you had a strong dad. Yeah. Did you ever go to him during that period of time? Did yeah. he know you were going through that? Oh, yeah. I mean, a big, strong dad with giant hands, and yeah. you've got a kid who's crying for us the yeah. hours a day. Yeah. What, what did he say? Well, Buck up? I remember, what did he say? No, I, 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 would, I would go talk to him. And I remember one day up in that little Baptist church office, I couldn't stand that office. It was I, I, to, every time <laughs> I think about it, I get chills down my spine. It was just so old, and <laughs> and it was just it had that I, smell, that musty yeah, smell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it had that green olive carpet. I mean, oh, uh, anyway, sweet people. Those people were most of them were very gracious to me, and they knew that the mature ones kind of knew what was going on with me. Hmm. I never really talked to him about it, but they they knew something was going on. I think they could sense it, and um, they knew I was broken because that church that I had had some success at was again ten miles away. They weren't you know ignorant of it. I remember one day I was in that office, and oh, so I got into that doctoral program, and they had some tough courses. And I was thinking to myself, I would if I was in my other church, I I I couldn't do this work. I mean, these guys are crazy. You couldn't work on your doctorate. I couldn't do it. It they wanted. I had one class, and I still remember this. I read twenty two books for one class, and I wrote, uh, I want to say fourteen papers. And uh, so, anyway, and and so that helped me. It gave me something to do, but. After about the two-year mark, those real tough classes up front were going to go away, and it would not be as difficult, I was told. And it hit me one day, in six months, uh, I'm not going to have as much as a challenge academically. Then what am I going to do? And it freaked me out. Really? It really, and I thought, well, this is what's kept me from crying, is that I have something to do, and I'm accomplishing something. And I, and I really started to get depressed. And so what I did was... Uh, I, I went and saw my dad and uh, I called him and I said, hey, are you around? He goes, yeah. I said, I need to come over and talk to you. He said, yeah, come on. So I got over there and he said, what's going on? And I said, all right, dad, here's the deal. So, you know, this has been good for me to do all this coursework. Yeah, he said, I get that. He said, I, I realized today in six months that's going to be done and I'll just have a course here and a course there. And they already said it's not as difficult. And dad, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what's going to keep me from falling back in this pit in six months. 
And he said, well, he said, you know, Steve, that makes sense. I can understand that. But he said, let me tell you, let me tell you the deal. God's already got that for you. That six months, when you're done, he's going to bring something else. I'm just telling you, it's what he's going to do. It's what he does. He's got, the, so you got another chapter. And you don't know how it's going to sort out, but you don't need to sort out. But I'm telling you that when you're done with this challenge and you don't want to fall back into the pit and you're doing well and you're learning things, this is good. He said, he's going to have something else for you. He said, let's just watch the Lord do it. And so let's fast forward six months. I just had finished the last paper for those, those, those two foundational courses. And um, it's the same week. I just finished it. I'm getting ready at the end of the day to go home. And the secretary said, Steve, there's a guy on the phone uh, calling. We used to call it long distance. There's a yeah. guy calling <laughs> long call. distance. Yeah. <laughs> His name is Dennis Rainey. And I thought, Dennis Rainey, where do I know that name? Dennis Rainey. And, and, and she said, he said he's a friend of Robert Lewis's and he's in Arkansas. And I went, oh yeah, that's Robert's buddy. Well, not only was I in seminary with Stu, but with Robert Lewis, who oh, did were. the authentic manhood. Yeah, yeah, Robert was up there. So- uh, well, Rainey lives out in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas. Yeah, he does. And so, uh, I said, okay, so I get on the phone with this guy, and I'd never met him. I just, the name rang a bell. And he said, Steve, I'm Dennis, you know, with mutual friend and Robert. I go, yeah, yeah, Robert's mentioned yet. He said, do you know what, what, what I'm doing with Campus Crusade? And I said, no. He said, well, we have a, what's called family life, and uh, it's a marriage ministry. And uh, I, he said, have you ever been to one of the conferences? I said, no. <laughs> He said, have you heard about it? And I said, well, is that the deal that Robert and Sherrod are speaking at? And he goes, yeah. I said, so I'm aware of that's all I know, Dennis. And he said, well, he said, Steve, I've never made a phone call like this before. But I am calling. He said, I've never heard you speak. I'm calling to see if you might be interested in joining our speaker team and traveling around the country and speaking at these marriage conferences. And I didn't even know what he was offering. But, um, and then I went home and I said, well, let me think about it and talk to um, Mary and um, let me give you a call back in a few days. He said, sure, that'd be great. So I talked to Mary. Well, this is the providence of God. So Mary said, um, oh, Dennis Rainey, yeah. He worked for my dad for a number of years in Crusade when he first went on board there. And, uh, yeah, I know, I don't, I know Dennis really well. And, uh, he said, oh, that's really interesting. And she said that, that'd probably be a really good thing, Steve. And six months later, I'm speaking to groups of a thousand, 1500, 1800, all over the country about, you know, once every two to three months and the elders in the church, the deacons were all for it. See, when you think there is no way, God always has a way. Um, uh, and you, you could spend a million years trying to figure out what's coming next, and so, you'll never so, figure it out. So let's reset that for everybody who's just listening to this. You're completely depressed, unemployed. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, I'm, I, well, yeah, I was unemployed before, for a while. Yeah. Before. You finally get a job at a church you literally yeah. can't stand, don't want yeah. to be at. You're yeah. crying all the time. Yeah. And a couple years later, you're on this massive speaking team with Robert Lewis and Dennis Rainey. Yeah, Crawford Loritz. Crawford Loritz. Yeah. Bunch I, of other guys. It's funny. I, my wife and I went to that conference in 1992. Yeah. Um, and I remember we were in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And my wife and I, we'd been married for two years, had a great marriage. We were the best of friends. And we were like, oh, that was interesting. It was a Friday night. It was nice, but we don't really need it because we're so happily married and we're so amazing. Mm -hmm. I hadn't yet been broken. <laughs> that morning, we got in this, ma I think the biggest fight of our marriage. Wow screaming at each other and then to the point where she finally got jumped in the car and went to the conference by herself and then i went and hmm. so we still remember that because we we really don't i haven't been in a fight with my wife in 15 years probably yeah, yeah. but our, we still bring up that was that knockdown <laughs> that drag off you were probably the speaker it's probably your fault I, i'm sure it was yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's crazy so you know we got you know 10 minutes left yeah um 
It's your question. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. But, but see, I, let, let me put it this way. The Lord, you ask how I eventually got in the men's ministry. That, um, there was another chapter I won't go into because we don't have time, but where I was redirected again. I had another major disappointment, and I didn't see any way to recover from it. I was emotionally stronger because of what I'd gone through before. But again, I was in another wilderness, and God used that to absolutely push me into men's ministry. And uh, looking back, it's absolutely, you can just see it. It's crystal clear at the time. I, 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 was, I was flummoxed again. I, I, I mention that because you usually don't go to the wilderness just one time. Hmm. You, you'll go another time or, you Sometimes know. Sometimes you need a refresher course. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. a good way to put it. It's a refresher. And, and it's not always as intense as the worst time. And, you know, there are different levels. But if you're teachable and, and every time you learn more, you learn to trust him more. That's how I got into men's ministry. Kim, what I would say, and I never could imagine what God was going to do. I mean, I'm stunned by what he did all those years. I, I would say this. The greatest things God, God has ever done for me in my life have come out of the greatest disappointments. When my plans were dashed, when they were killed, God resurrected. So for the, someone who's out there listening, I want them to have hope. God, God is sovereign over these things. He controls them. And if you'll stay teachable, he'll bring you out and he'll use you. And, I interrupted. Yeah, no, no, because my question was actually going to lead on to what you just said. How should somebody deal with a spouse going through this? So, you, you know, Mary handled this perfectly for you. If yeah. you're a man listening to this and your wife's going through it or yeah. the wife's listening to this and her husband, yeah. what was it that Mary did that was you know, the right thing. What's advice would you have for the spouse of someone? She, um, she, she, she knew I wanted to learn the lessons. I think that makes a huge difference. If your spouse is um, not teachable, whatever they're going through, that, that, that's going to make everything really, really hard. Um, so, so let's assume, let's assume the best here that whatever they're going through, and then years down the road, Mary went through some things, a, a lot of physical things. Uh, but I, I knew where her heart was with the Lord. Um, she encouraged me. She knew I was teachable. She, when I was absolutely ready to. give up she would just she would say something that would put courage in my heart in the middle of that chapter that was so hard at that little baptist church i came home one day i was so depressed and we had two little kids and another one on the way and i i said mary i just had to get out of there and she she said well i understand that and she said this has just been a tough season steve and i said yeah, it, it has been, and I don't know if we'll ever get out of it. And she's, words to this, she said, Steve, we'll get out of it. She said, we'll get out of it. And I said, well, I hope you're right. And she said, Steve, look it. Right now, there are actually some benefits right now. The kids are young. They're little. You've got a lot of time with them. You don't have a lot of pressures at that church. You don't have any pressures. So you you spend a lot of time with them right now. It's not always going to be that way. He, he, she said, Steve, down the road, you're going to be flying around the country, speaking at conferences, doing all these. And I said, hold on right there. I know you're trying to encourage me, but don't make up this fantasy land stuff. I don't want to hear that stuff. And she said, okay, but I, I think that's what God's getting you ready for. <laughs> and she was right. She could kind of see what was going on. I couldn't. But let me put it this way. If you don't see it that clearly and if it looks really bad, you just encourage and you let them know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm committed. We, this is what I signed up for, for better or worse, richer or poorer, sickness and health. You know, hey, anybody can be committed when there's health. But when there's sickness, that's tough. When there's stage four cancer, 
That's tough. But see, that's when that's what separates the boys from the men. And that's where you step up and you're a servant and you say, Lord Jesus, help me. And I don't know what I'm doing here. I need, I need more patience, whatever it is you need. But you're there and you're not going anywhere. I am with you right here. I'm not, I'm here. We're going through this together. Do you um do you still get depressed now? Uh, I've been fighting it off. It's I, not like I used to. I've learned to fight it off, and I've been fighting it off, uh, particularly the last um, uh, two weeks. Really? Mm-hmm. Is is there a cause to it, or is it just something that comes yeah, on you? There's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I know. There is, no, there is a cause. I, I think we're at a crossroads in this country. And I think a lot of Christian people don't see it. And I, I think it's, it's major, and uh, it's going to affect the future of our kids and our grandkids. And I have to remind myself constantly that God is sovereign, that he is in absolute control, that he is at work, that he has a plan, that he has a purpose. Um, but it's, I, I have to fight to, to, I cannot walk away from what is true. I can't watch too much media stuff. I, I have to focus on scripture to stay grounded um, and to not lose my joy and peace and confidence in the Lord. And then along with that, there's something else that has come up. But yeah, so sometimes, you know, it's intense, but but you kind of learn to fight it off. But I I have, it's been more of a, it's interesting you'd ask that. Because I I told Mary last night, I, I the last two weeks have been a, as hard as I've had in years and years. Is that right? Yeah. Well, number one, I asked it for a couple of reasons. And, and to go with what you're saying, you know, a lot of Christians give us these little trite answers, mm-hmm. you know, these little stupid, foolish yeah. things. And, uh, well, God's in control. Yes, and, and he was in control when, when Israel got taken down and all the women got raped and the men got tortured to death. He was in control, right? Yeah, yeah. And Jeremiah was there yes. lamenting and whining and crying. Yes. And yes. for his, you know, for his words, they lowered him down into a sewer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when when judgment comes on a land, yeah. godly people suffer with the ungodly. Right. We know that to be yeah. true. That's right. So it's okay for us to be concerned and upset and not give people dumb, trite answers. Let's deal with the issues as they are. And until judgment comes on us, let's start talking about what we can do to bring about repentance. And exactly. Through... There you go. But I ask you for another reason, too, because I think you know, when you look at history, a lot of the greatest men of history suffered with depression. You know, yeah. Abraham Lincoln talks about the dark monster coming on him, Winston yeah. Churchill, yeah. Uh, Martin Luther. Yeah. These are yeah. people who suffered from it. And I think there's a, a misnomer that if you're a godly enough Christian, then um, you yeah. wouldn't suffer from depression. I mean, Howard yeah. Hendricks suffered from oh, depression. Oh, he did, sure. Yeah. He was on the Promise Keeper's board. Sure, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I, I mean, it's remarkable. You read, and I've, I, if, if I have a hobby, it's reading biographies. And... Um, and you see, you see those who have been, who've had an impact in the world. It's remarkable how many of them, as you said so well, have have struggled deeply with that deep depression, deep depression. And uh, it's it's one of the tools that I think the Lord uses. There was uh, there's a difference between Lee, Lincoln's first inaugural address and his second. He obviously, because of the depression and because of all the pressure on him that we all know about with the nation being split. He obviously came to know the Lord. It's clear from the second inauguration. Uh, yeah, God uses different things. God uses these these setbacks. He uses these afflictions. Uh, Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. You know, Philippians 1, 29, it's been granted to you not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for his sake. He uses this stuff. And uh, he builds spiritual muscle. And uh, sometimes you get fatigued and you get worn out and you're not even sure you can take. 
I remember in that depression, I, I wouldn't ask the Lord to help me make it through the day. I'd ask him to help me make it to lunch. Really? Yeah, I was dead wow. serious. Just get me to lunch. Lord, if you can get me, would you just somehow get me through the next four hours without falling apart? <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, and I, I'd never been that way in my life. But it was exactly what I need. God put me in the wilderness. He put me in his gym, in his gymnasium. And he was working me out. So as we close, yeah. if someone's suffering from depression right now, yeah. what, 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 what do you have for them? What word would you give them? Well, there's, all right. So here's what I learned about depression. Um, it, it can be physical. It can be hormonal. When a guy comes to me now and says I'm struggling with depression and I just quit my job and I'm you know I walked away and I don't know what I'm going to do or something, the first thing I say to him is, "Have you had your testosterone checked?" Believe it or not, really, because I've had doctors tell me that, and um, and I I found it to be true. I have some doctors that know the Lord and I and, and they just said at certain times it's a testosterone deal. It's just physical, and Lloyd Jones says that in his book, and he was a medical doctor. All right, so it can be, and for a woman, it can be hormonal, that kind of thing. So, you know, get checked out physically. But the other reason for depression is great loss, L-O-S-S. -S. Um, you, you, um, you, you lose a small business. You lose uh, your health. You lose a marriage. You lose a child. You lose, it's just great, great loss that um, uh, darkens your life and you're not sure you'll ever recover, you'll ever get your life back. And so what I, I would say, this is what I recommend if to those who are in depression because of loss, fear of the future, regret from the past, get a hold of the book by Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, Spiritual Depression. Martin is M-A-R-T-Y-N, and then Lloyd-Jones, L-L-O-Y-D hyphen, J-O-N-E-S, Spiritual Depression. He was a medical doctor. He, that man had an ability to open up the word of God and apply it. The Lord used that in my life. So that's what I would recommend. And he'll get you into the scriptures and certain scriptures you can memorize. And, you know, and you have other people in your life. That's what I, where I would start. Okay, so depression comes from, it could be physical. Could be physical. Could be uh, great loss. What about sin, unrepentant sin? Does that lead to depression? Oh, that's that's great. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 130, out of the depths I've cried to you, O Lord. And when he starts to lose hope, he, he says, and in your word do I hope. So if, if it's because of sin, as it was with David, what do you do? You repent. You turn from that sin. You admit it before the Lord Jesus. You come absolutely clean. I, I mean, uh, Thomas Watson said repentance is the vomiting of the soul. Hmm. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a, oh, I'm sorry, I got caught. It, it's from the heart. It's from the gut. It's the dry heaves. And you dry heave up that sin before the Lord. And you say, dear God, I loathe what I did. And I, 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 I come to you and I ask your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And I, I, I I'm, I want all in with you. Psalm 51, uh, Psalm 32. Um, and, and then does that mean he'll immediately take you up out of the depths? No, you'll, you'll be forgiven if it's a genuine repentance uh, that's, that's not you know superficial. A broken and contrite spirit he will not despise. Uh, does that mean all your problems are over? No but you're forgiven. Mm. And now he'll begin to rebuild you slowly. That's good stuff. Yeah. I think this will help a lot of people, man. Thanks, Steve. Good. You're welcome. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for listening to On the Edge podcast with Ken Harrison. For a lot of you, this is our first time meeting, and I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. 
follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison. Oh,